Hi everyone, the pericope I will be discussing today is taken from Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 40. From the beginning of the Old Testament, there was a promise that the seed of a woman would one day crush the serpent's head. The anticipation of a Messiah burned in the hearts of devout Jews who were eager to have a Redeemer. The fulfillment of the coming Messiah is a major theme in the Lucan narrative that is intertextually woven with Old Testament scriptures regarding the promise of redemption. This redemptive thread of salvation connects the chosen nation of Israel with the rejected Gentiles, alluding to a universal scope of the gospel. Intertextual connections between Luke's writings and the Pentateuch implies to a governing Christological foundation. The narrator establishes powerful insights of devotion, peace, salvation, and redemption through the thoughts and actions of his characters. He opens the scene of this pericope with Jesus getting circumcised, alluding to the Abrahamic covenant, and then quotes from the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 12 and verse 8, a scripture that enforces the importance and purpose of sin offerings. The scene begins in the temple with the act of ecclesiastical obedience of Mary and Joseph to the law of Moses. Before Jesus could become the fulfillment of these prophecies, he had to first fulfill the law by being consecrated to the Lord. In this unparalleled dedication, Jesus unequivocally belongs to the Lord, something his parents slowly come to understand as their confusion in chapter 2 verse 32 shows. The beginning and ending of this pericope's significance explores far beyond mere rhetorical devices and parallelisms and inclusions through connecting Jesus with his purpose of becoming the temple by being tabernacled in the flesh. God communed with humanity to design an elaborate physical structure on earth where he could visit his people. The temple is the architectural setting in Luke chapter 2 symbolizing the epic center of Israel's culture and religion. The Old Testament tabernacle possessed no ethereal beauty when you looked upon its exterior. It appeared dull with common, common materials covering its courts. The real beauty was within the holiest of holies, decorated with fine linens, furniture made with pure gold, and a place where the Shekinah glory of God would enter and rest upon the mercy seat. Just as the glory of God was hidden within the holiest of holies, there was a hidden glory within Jesus. When he came to pitch his tent among us, he did not lay aside his deity, rather he veiled his glory in flesh. The prologue of John proclaims that the word became flesh and tented or tabernacled among us. The body of Jesus is raised up in place of this destroyed temple. Jesus took place, Jesus took the place of the temple by taking up residence among his people. Now people may meet and commune with God face to face, and God proves his proximity by demonstrating his infinite love by being tabernacled in human form. The first character that we are introduced to is Simeon, who is a righteous and devout man, which encourages readers to trust his voice and to trust his reputation. The narrator's purpose surfaces from the temple scene, but only the voice of Simeon speaks with a total of 88 words. The opening phrase of Simeon is known as the New Dimittis, a song that originates from the Latin language. This hymn also formulated language borrowed from Isaiah. Christologically, the mission of Jesus is portrayed in this model of the Isaiah suffering servant. Jesus is taken by Simeon in his arms, and Simeon says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory to your people, Israel. Simeon's first words declare the Lord is sovereign, expressing reverence to a king. He also speaks of peace and salvation, which is another reoccurring Lucan theme that concerns the eschatological fulfillment of the Messiah. 
Salvation will come to all nations through Jesus Christ, the light of revelation to Gentiles, and the glory to God's chosen people, promoting another Lutheran theme of a universal gospel. Luke then introduces another main character, Anna, an elderly woman, the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. After Anna suffered the loss of her husband, she devoted the rest of her life to perpetual prayer and fasting, worshiping God day and night. Her devout lifestyle occasioned her for the opportunity to see the child who would bring redemption to Jerusalem. While Anna's dedication and piety to the Lord is an extremely important point in the narrative, Luke purposefully alludes to an Old Testament story without even going into detail. He annotates on Anna's ancestry, stating that she is the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of, tribe of Asher. Of all things Luke could have said about Anna, why did he focus on her tribe and why did he focus on her father's name? Asher was one of the northern tribes, yet this woman was a faithful Israelite. There is a significant historiographical position to consider regarding the name of Anna's, Anna's father. Her father's name is a variant of the Hebrew name Penuel or Peniel, which means face to face with God. Luke, without intentionally explaining its reference to Anna's ancestry, alludes to the Old Testament story of Jacob wrestling with the angel until morning and seeing God face to face. The organization of certain details in this pericope illuminates Old Testament narrative accounts. Luke referring to Anna's father, Penuel, whose name means face to face with God, seems to position readers to comprehend the connection of Jacob's experience by facilitating an understanding that they are now face to face with God through Jesus. Luke chapter 2 and verse 24 it represents the first explicit quotation from the Old Testament in Luke's writings by quoting Le Leviticus chapter 12 and verse 8. It states, And if she is not able to bring forth a lamb, that she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one as a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering. So the priests shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. The law of purification required that there would be one lamb that was one year old and unblemished, evoking memories of the great deliverance that God orchestrated by mandating his people to apply the blood of a one year old lamb as a covering, commencing the first sacrifice of the Passover. This arrangement of scripture, it has an established setting with three separate ceremonies taking place, all echoing Old Testament laws. The first of three ceremonies that we will focus on today is mentioned, uh, that is mentioned, is the purification ceremony. Hebrew law states that the birth of a boy made a woman unclean for seven days and commands her to remain at home for 40 days without touching anything holy, requiring her to go through a cleansing process. She then was to offer the sacrifice at the main Nicanor Gate on the east side of the Court of Women. This sin offering's purpose was to make atonement for impurities of an individual, permitting, permitting them to be ceremonially clean again. Why was Mary, God's chosen vessel, required to offer a sin offering when she herself did not sin? If children are God's inheritance and considered a blessing, it is certainly not an outrageous act to give birth to them. And if children are a gift from the Lord, how does a sin offering contribute to this joyous occasion? It is important to understand the process of bringing forth life is not impure and sinful if it's within the context of marriage, but it was the bleeding of a woman following birth that rendered the new mother unclean. This sacrifice was to cleanse an individual of their impurities, varying from defilement doing, due to the release of bodily fluids or desecration of God's commandments by sinning. Luke's quotation of the Old Testament recapitulates the importance of the Law of Moses in their current soteriology while guiding people to the identity of Jesus and purposefully revealing that he is the one who will fulfill the law. 
Even though blood was considered the seal and sign of life, it was also the substance that inflicted defilement on an individual. If a person came into contact with blood, even if it was their own, they became ceremonially unclean and were required to sacrifice a sin offering to the Lord. The irony found throughout this pericope is astounding because the blood of Jesus, a substance that would make us unclean and impure, cleanses us and makes us whole. Jesus becomes the ultimate sin offering as the Passover lamb to redeem us with his precious blood, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The next main focus in this pericope is concerning circumcision. And to understand the meaning of circumcision, we need a soteriological foundation to reveal the divine significance of the removal of flesh. God's purpose reveals itself as the benefits of separation are displayed through a God who visits his people in a transcendent way in the Old Testament by setting Abraham and his bloodline apart from other nations, and then he visits humanity transformationally in the New Testament by veiling himself in human frame with the intention to fulfill the law. God ordains Abram, a Gentile, to generate a nation through his loins and establishes a covenant through the act of separation. Other inhabitants of the known world, such as the Canaanites and Egyptians, practice circumcision for preparation for marriage, or it signified a man's coming of age, or it was an offering to a deity. If other nations practice circumcision, what makes this command by God so unique, and what makes this command by God so special? Unlike other cultures who practice circumcision, here we discover it has nothing to do with age or marital status, but it is connected with a covenant. The Hebrews alone focused on the intimate relationship between a covenant God and circumcision as the mark of that covenant. God promises Abraham he will be a father of many nations and that his seed will generate kings. This promise establishes a bloodline that will produce the anticipated kingship of the Messiah, allowing the authorial audience to recognize the same theological planning we see lying behind the structure of, geneal of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, the son of Abraham. The mention of the word seed in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 12 is designated to the offering and descendants of an individual. The first mention of this word seed in Hebrew Zera, the first mention of, the, of it in the LXX is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, when God promises to put enmity between the woman's offspring and the serpent. This promise is spoken by God. To, this promise spoken by God is fulfilled when Jesus is born of a woman and later crushes the serpent's head by becoming the world's sin offering through his crucifixion. Through the piety of Mary and Joseph, Jesus enters into this covenant with Abraham, which reigns powerfully when Jesus later proclaims in the book of John before Abraham was, I am, making a declarative statement of who he is as a redeemer of his people. Luke is also preparing the contemporary Jewish demographic to a new kind of circumcision that will later be presented, one that is made without hands. Several times in scripture, God sets people apart by a distinction in their physicalities. For instance, every time Jacob limped as a result of the angel touching the socket of his hip, he was reminded of the extraordinary meeting with the Lord. Circumcision is a mnemonic sign reminding God's people of who they are, from what they have been delivered, and by whom they have been delivered. Circumcision gives privilege to a man because every time he sees his cut and imperfect flesh, it is an unceasing reminder of the covenant between him and his God. It also makes God accountable to his covenant, reminding him of his promise to Abraham and his offspring. In conclusion, Luke's temple narrative has a frame of reference that abolishes any kind of limitation placed on economic 
racial and gender inequalities by promoting the inclusion of all nations to receive salvation and redemption. This parakope focuses on the veracity of God's love by speaking through Simeon and Anna, establishing a universal gospel to be preached to the whole world by revealing who Jesus is, the light to the Gentiles, and glory to Israel. Luke's quotation from the book of Leviticus associates his readers with their foundational soteriology, framing his narrative to display a striking fulfillment of prophecy concerning Jesus, their anticipated messianic king, who is dedicated in the temple. Luke sets a precedent for people to gradually come to their own understanding of who Jesus is by illuminating his audience's awareness of the eschatological fulfillment of salvation through this baby who will soon become their son.